So we're headed into a, a space of the book of Mark um, where we're kind of uh, we're coming to the end of a section and uh, then uh, we'll break for the summer and then in the fall we'll head into kind of the final section of Mark. Um, and so during these next several weeks, so we're going to be in this for the next uh, through, through the month of May. Uh, even into the month of June, uh, like the first week of June, I think is when we'll finish with this section of Mark. And so please bring your Bible with you each week because we're going to be going verse by verse through these texts, okay? Um, all right, uh, the, uh, how many of you have ever had an experience where it's been hard for you to come, like, go public with your faith in a specific situation, right? It doesn't have to be every situation. But in a particular situation, you felt it difficult to go public with your faith, right? Uh, I, if, if you think that it's easier for me, it's not, okay? Uh, like, I, I can talk about times of when I have been playing golf. Uh, so I love to play golf, and I will go play golf oftentimes as a single. Um, and so I'll just find a tee time online, and I'll book it for myself, and then I'll end up getting partnered with two or three other guys. And... Um, or ladies, sometimes. Uh, so, uh, equal opportunity church here. Uh, anyway, um, so, uh, but but I'll get paired or partnered with a, a group that I did not intend to play with, and and I'll start playing golf, and we'll get through about six holes, and things are going good, and I'm playing good, and they're having fun, and it's great. They're about three beers in. I've drank a bottle of water. We're good to go. And uh, and and then the the question inevitably comes out like, hey man, what do you do? And that's about the time that I go. Mm. <clears throat> it's real hard to tell you what I do now because uh, you're going to change your complete disposition the rest of the day, right? Like, uh, and, and so that's, that's like, so hard for me because I, I always go, I'm a pastor of a local church, and then they, for the next 12 holes, because we played six, for the next 12 holes, they are like angels, you know? <laughs> I mean, like, their, their mom is looking down going, man, I raised them right, you know? <laughs> Uh, and uh, so anyway, it, it, it becomes one of those things that like for me, it's hard because I, I don't want anybody to put on a mask for me. I just want people to be who they are and I don't expect them to act differently or behave differently because I'm a follower of Jesus or because I'm a pastor. Um, and, uh, and yet that oftentimes is what happens. So sometimes it's hard for me to, to just come out of it and just go, yeah, I'm a pastor of church. Uh, you know, let me tell you about Jesus, all that, all that kind of stuff. Because uh, I, I want to build a relationship and, and those kinds of things. Some of you guys know what that's like because some of you work in a place or you have are employed in a place where if you were to go public with your faith, you could potentially be reprimanded for that. Uh, some of you uh, have, have been around a group of friends and you've kind of come to faith, but they haven't really come to faith. And it's, and it's hard for you to be public about your faith or go public with your faith because, well, you're afraid that you're going to lose all your friends. And then there's also the aspect of like, oh, well, it's also sometimes hard when you start uh, dating someone and then you come to faith and then you guys get married, but like they're still not where you're at spiritually and so it's hard to just always be so excited about Jesus in their presence, right? Uh, a lot of us understand what this is like, right? We, we understand the feeling of how difficult this can be. Uh, but then there's some of us in the room who don't understand this at all. We're like, man, I'm going to tell everybody and anybody that I meet about Jesus. Like, I'm passing out tracts when I'm leaving church to the people who are at church. You know what I'm saying? Like, like we're, we're, we're just, we're just doing, like, I'm going to talk about Jesus all day, every day. I don't care who's upset and who's offended by it, right? Um, and, and you wear, like, Jesus my homeboy t-shirts and all the stuff. You know, you do it all. Now, here, here's the thing. I get it. I understand it. Uh, and, 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 but but we, have, we have two groups of people, and some it's, it's more difficult some it's easier and 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 yet there is always going to come a time there is always going to come a time as a follower of Jesus where you are going to have to stand up and and say this is what I believe and this is what I believe because to not do that would mean you lose something far greater than, um, than what you're trying to protect or hold on to. And that's similar to the situation that we see play out here. Um, so if you will, let's, let's start reading verse 21. It says, When Jesus had again crossed over by a boat to the other side of the lake, a crowd gathered around him while he was 
by the lake. So you'll remember from last week, we had Jesus on the other side of the lake, and he was hanging out with uh, this guy who had a legion of demons. He cast the, the demons into the pigs. The pigs go down the hill into the water and drown, and we all had barbecue last Sunday, right? It was great. Um, and, and so uh, if you weren't here, you missed it. We had a pig picking. It was amazing. Uh, anyway, uh, so, so, uh, but, but, so he's going. For, they, they, all the people wanted him to leave, right? You guys remember this? Remember that the people on that side were like, hey, Jesus, can you please leave? Like, we don't want you here. You're scaring us, like, with what you can do. And so he doesn't argue with him. He just gets in the boat and goes back. So this is him going, and he's showing up on the other side of the shore, and there's a crowd gathered there. And so it's interesting because this probably means he's going to Capernaum. This is where Jesus has done most of his ministry through the book of Mark thus far. And, uh, and these people obviously have heard of Jesus. They know Jesus. They've seen Jesus. And they like Jesus because they're getting around him. And so, so here's the thing. So he shows up. He leaves a group of people. It's just such an interesting disposition. He leaves a group of people who say, I don't want to have anything to do with you, Jesus. And he heads into a group of people that are like, I want everything to do with you. Right? Everybody's wanting his attention. It says in verse 22, it says, Then one of the synagogue leaders named Jairus came to him, saw Jesus, and fell at his feet. Do you guys, did you guys catch what Mark did just there? Last week, our verse of the week was uh, that, you know, he, he saw Jesus, ran to Jesus, fell at his feet. And Jairus, this guy who's not demon-possessed, is doing the same thing. He sees Jesus. Jesus is his hope. He goes to Jesus, and he bows down at his feet. Now, the interesting thing about Jairus is Jairus, it says, is the synagogue leader. So for him to, like, publicly pronounce that he believes Jesus and that he believes in Jesus would have been, like, social suicide, right? I mean, here he is, this prominent Jewish figure in his, in his town. His town is a small town. So his job isn't very, like, it's not a prestigious job, but he is probably one of the most wealthy people and one of the most, like, biblically sound individuals, and he's probably a prominent leader in the community. Like, most people probably know who he is. So for him to go public with his faith in Jesus by walking up to Jesus in this manner and even falling down at his feet as if he's worshiping him as he's worshiping God is a really, really big deal. The fact that he would step out and do that sort of thing it just, it, it, I mean, it, it just, it comes off the page if you understand the context of what's going on. That here's a guy who, he's afraid of being found out as a believer, but, but, he's, but what we're gonna find out is there's something he's more afraid of than losing his reputation. Look at this. He says, he pleaded earnestly with him. So Jairus is pleading with Jesus. My daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live so Jesus went with him. So he, he is more afraid. What is driving this faith? What is driving this faith? He is more afraid of losing his daughter than he is of losing his reputation. He is more afraid of losing his daughter than losing his reputation. And so that, that fear is actually what drives him into a faith that he's acting upon to say, God, I, I believe in you, Jesus. I believe if you'll just touch her. She could be healed. It's really, really interesting. It says Jesus went with him. So Jesus, like, stops what he's doing, all this crowd around him, and he just now, Jairus and Jairus' daughter are his main point of focus. That's where he's headed. He's going to Jairus' house. <laughs> then it says, a large crowd followed and pressed around him. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had, yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. You guys ever felt that way about anything in your life? That no matter what you tried to do, things just kept getting worse and not better? You th you're trying to do whatever you can do to get better, but things just keep getting worse? For this woman, she's been bleeding for 12 years. This bleeding is, uh, is uh, menstrual bleeding, it, it, but it just doesn't stop. 
the flow always continues. For 12 years, she's been this way, uh, dealing with this struggle. And what this meant in her culture and in her society was that she was unclean. Uh, in this culture, in this society, if you uh, came around someone uh, during this uh, menstrual cycle, you were deemed unclean, and everyone that you came in contact with would be deemed unclean. You had to m- remove yourself from the community and then go through ceremonial washings and everything else before you could come back into the community. So here is this unclean woman who has done anything and everything she can. She looks like she's pretty wealthy, says that she actually tried many doctors right, which was not cheap, and spent all she had. So at one point, she was very wealthy to the point that, like, I have enough money, I'm going to go after this thing. Anyone ever think that money could get you out of a problem? Am I the only one, right? Like, only for more and more and more things to come up. This is what she's doing. She's like, man, I'm just going to go see doctor after doctor after doctor, and I'll be healed, and it doesn't work. It doesn't work. She just gets worse. She spent all she had. She's now broke, has nothing. It says, when she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I could just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately, her bleeding stopped, and she felt in her body that she was freed from suffering. At once, Jesus realized that the power had gone out of him. He turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding against you, the disciples answered, and yet you can ask who touched me, right? Isn't that, isn't that interesting? There's something different about this woman's touch. And, I mean, Jesus has 400 people touching him right now or trying to touch him right now, right? And, and yet there is something different about her touch. We're gonna figure out what that is in just a second but Jesus kept looking I love that he wouldn't give up he kept looking around who is this person I got to meet this person who touched me you know he's not going to stop says he kept looking around to see who had done it then the woman knowing what had happened to her came and fell at his feet trembling with fear and told him the whole truth here's the deal This woman is unclean. She feels unclean. She feels isolated because of her condition. She's not allowed to be a part of the community. And here she is pushing her way through a crowd, touching probably hundreds of people on her way to Jesus. And she's saying, I'm not going to let anything stop me. And now she's afraid. She's afraid that what she has done is going to end up really bad for her. But she still tells the whole truth. She says, this is it. I've had this condition for 12 years. I haven't been able to be healed. I'm broke. I have no hope. I'm hopeless. Told the whole truth. She's vulnerable with Jesus. Do you see this? I mean, to come out with what she's dealing with amidst this huge crowd of people That's a real vulnerability. And here's the thing. I think it's so powerful about Jesus and what I wish was so true about the church is that Jesus is a place, he's a safe place to go where you can be fully vulnerable with whatever it is you're going through and whatever it is you're dealing with. And he does not reject you but he offers you mercy and kindness and hope and healing. The sad thing is, is I, 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 think, I think the church often resembles the religious system of Jesus' day more than it does Jesus. And that this woman was afraid to be vulnerable because of what might be said and what might be done to her. And the, I, I, it's my experience that the church can be like that sometimes. The church can be a tough place for people to come clean. A tough place for people to be vulnerable. And if that's true, then I think we have to ask ourselves, is that because the church doesn't look enough like Jesus? Because if we did, if we looked more like Jesus, maybe it wouldn't be so hard for people to just Walk up. 
no matter what's going on in their life, just searching for hope, searching for healing. My prayer is, is that this church would be a safe place where people look a lot like Jesus and where you can come and you can be loved and welcomed no matter what you're dealing with. You can be vulnerable and authentic and you don't have to hide. You can be free and find freedom. That's what my prayer is. Okay? I'm not saying that we're there yet, but that is my prayer. But I love this. This is the difference about her touch and everyone else's touch. Verse 34, Jesus says, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. Go in peace. Be freed from your suffering. See, there is something, and we're going to talk about this a lot more next week, but there's something about uh, Jesus' power um, that is unleashed by faith. So, in other words, Jesus always has the power to heal, but his power is often only manifest through our faith. He always has the power to do the impossible. But often, you will only see the impossible if you believe and have enough faith to believe in the impossible and that he is the God of the impossible, that he can take care of the impossible. He can make a way when there's no other way. See, the difference is Jesus being touched by hundreds of people in this moment. The difference in this one person's touch is that her faith Believing more than anything that Jesus is the one that could provide healing. And so she reaches out and she touches the hem of his garment, knowing that he holds more power in the hem of his garment than the whole of the enemy. And it is a beautiful, beautiful scene of restoration and freedom from suffering. Now, what about Jairus? Right? I mean, didn't this story start with Jairus? Wasn't Jesus on his way somewhere? You notice Jesus got interrupted? You notice that Jesus never seemed to be in a hurry? I mean, he stopped. He looked around. He tried to find this woman who had so much faith. He's never in a hurry. And he's okay being interrupted. Sometimes, sometimes I think maybe we don't go to Jesus because we're afraid that he doesn't want to hear from us. Or maybe he's too busy with other things that are more important. I think this shows, no, 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 no. Jesus is okay being interrupted. No matter what it is you're going through. Just, just go interrupt him. We had a, uh, this, pa this past week, I was working on my sermon on Thursday. It's typically when I'm trying to, like, nail everything down. And uh, so I was up here at the office, and Mallory and the kids uh, were up here as well, because Mallory works here as well. And so uh, oftentimes, our kids spend the afternoons here. It's like their second home. Uh, and, uh, and so we have snacks in the, in the break room upstairs, and we have water and sodas and all this stuff, and give them candy just so that we can get work done and all this stuff. Um, but we're, we're, uh, we're here on Thursday, and I'm working, and, um, and I come out of my office at about five after five, just finished my sermon, and I look around, and it's like no one's there. And so I get home, and I say, hey, Mal, I said, um, I said, I thought you guys were going to be at the church. She goes, well, the kids got crazy, and I couldn't get any work done, so I just loaded them up, and we headed home. And I said, okay, well, you didn't say bye. And, uh, and she said, well, you were busy, and you were working. I just didn't want to interrupt you. And the kids wanted to say bye, but I just said, no, no, don't, don't, no, don't interrupt him. He's, he's, he's working hard, you know. And uh, I, just said, I just said, well, I'm their dad. They can always interrupt me. I'll stop whatever I'm doing 
to give him a hug and a kiss and tell him I love him and tell him I'll see him in a few minutes. I'll always be interrupted. It's not an interruption because I love him. The same is true here with Jesus. He's not upset about this interruption. He's got work to do. You sure? He's going to try and heal some girl from dying. It's pretty important stuff. Way more important than my sermon on Thursday. But, but, he, but he lets himself be interrupted because he loves him. And he loves us. So if you're ever wondering, like, oh, man, God's probably busy. He's probably got things. Just interrupt him. Interrupt him. But this interruption does prove inconvenient for Jairus. Look at verse 35. It says, while Jesus was speaking, some people came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader, and said, your daughter is dead. Why bother this teacher anymore? Overhearing what was said, Jesus told him, don't be afraid, just believe. You ever had a voice telling you, like, ah, you should just stop bothering Jesus. He can't help you. This is beyond hope. Ever had someone say, oh, too much for him. Your sin's too great. There's no way you'll be free from it, ever. That financial struggle, nah, no way. Jesus can't help you with that. You got yourself in that mess, you got to get yourself out. There's so many voices, aren't there, trying to silence the faith, trying to silence the belief that we have. And Jesus says, no, 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 don't let those voices create fear. Don't let those voices stir up fear in you. Just believe. Just believe. Just believe that he can make a way even though you can't see it. Just believe that he's more powerful than you because he is. <laughs> Just believe that he can do something in your life and through your life that you couldn't even dream or imagine. Just believe. Don't be afraid. Just believe. So, Jairus continues on with Jesus, and Jesus does this. He says, he did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James, and John. So it seems like all the disciples were there, and then he called out Peter, James, and John, and says, come on. And then they came to the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Jesus saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. This is a professional uh, job in the first century. You get hired to go to people's houses and put on sackcloth and ashes and yell and scream and wail and cry. And so um, these people, these people are just like making this huge, huge fuss when Jesus shows up with his disciples. And, uh, and it says that Jesus went in and said to them, why all this commotion and wailing? This child is not dead. She's only asleep. But they laughed at him. Now, here's the, here's the reality. These are, these are professional mourners, right? They are around death all the time. They've seen death like every week, their entire life. Jesus says, well, she's not dead. She's only sleeping. What's all this? Why, why, are, why are you all doing all this? This is, this, is not, this is not a good idea, right? Well, they're like, they laugh at him because they're like, bro, we've seen people die. She's dead, <laughs> right? Now, can you imagine Jairus' faith in that moment when the people who have seen death are laughing at the guy who's saying, no, 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 she ain't dead? Can you imagine? Does, do you think like faith is welling up in him right now? Like, oh man, the whalers don't even think we have a chance. Goodness gracious. Right? Like, they're so distraught. They're so brokenhearted. But Jesus doesn't let any of that bother him. He doesn't let people think 
that he's ridiculous for one second because he knows the power that he has. And it says this, after he put them out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him and they went where the child was and he took her by the hand and he said to her, Talitha kum, which means little girl, I say to you, get up. And immediately the girl stood up and began to walk around. She was 12 years old. At this, they were completely astonished. And he gave strict orders to not let anyone know about this and told them to give her something to eat. So, um, Jesus, from the end of chapter 4 to the end of chapter 5, he performs four miracles. The first miracle he performs at the end of chapter 4 is that he calms a storm by standing up and just saying, peace be still. And in that, he exercises his authority over the cosmos and over nature and over creation. And then the next miracle is he gets to the other side of the lake and there's this demon-possessed guy who has a legion of demons. And Jesus handles that like it's really no big deal. And, and man, in that he exercises his authority over the spiritual forces of darkness in our world. And then at the beginning of this chapter, or this section here, we see that, you know, he uh, comes in contact with this woman who's been bleeding for 12 years, who's got this disease, she's physically ailed, and Jesus heals her with just the, the slightest touch of his garment. And he exercises his power and authority over the flesh and over the living and um, and, 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 in healing the physical body. And then this fourth one, he exercises his authority over death. These stories, they all come back to back in the book of Mark. And one of the reasons, I think, is to show that Jesus, there's nothing that he can't do. And so we don't need to be afraid. We just need to have faith. We just need to believe because there's nothing that he can't do. And this resurrection, this resurrection that he offers to this 12-year-old little girl is just a precursor of his final miracle of where he will walk out of a grave three days after being crucified on a cross. And reveal that he truly does have authority and power over death once and for all. But the amazing thing about his life is that this little girl's gonna die again. Jesus will not. His resurrection is one time for all time. And it is for you and it is for me. Because the power that lives in Jesus and raised him from the dead lives in you and I if we're in Christ and so we can take hope knowing that we have nothing to fear including death so we don't mourn as people who fear death or people who have no hope but instead we welcome death because it's just a portal into abundant, new, and eternal life. That's the power that Jesus has. Do we believe? Do we have faith? Let us not be afraid to go public with our faith. Because if we do, Jesus might work the greatest of miracles in our life. Let us not be afraid of being seen as unclean or impure or unwelcome. But let us come boldly before Jesus knowing he is our only hope for freedom and life. Let's pray. God, thank you for today. Thank you for just the chance that we have to be here and to 
be in touch with these stories. Thank you for the power in which you bestow. The hope and life and freedom that you can give. Thank you that today we can say that death is not the end. Thank you that today we can say, because we are in Christ, we do not mourn as those who have no hope. Jesus, thank you for your love that we can never interrupt you. That you loved us so much and still love us so much that you came and died on the cross for our sins. And that through your death and resurrection, we might have eternal life. Let us live each day with eternity in mind, hoping and desiring more than anything to bring it right here, right now, as we walk with you, as we live for you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.